Afro, how does Maybank Investment Bank compete with giants of Rothschild, Nomura, and uh, JP Morgan? So this time uh, the package is better. 
But what I would hope for is for the tenant corporation to expand its mandate, not just to look at a talent that is outside, but actually to also have measures to retain the talent that is in Malaysia. You know, I, I, I think that a lot of talent in Malaysia, even though the Google give number of one plus million Malaysian working outside, but you know, there are a lot of talent here in Malaysia that are already here in Malaysia. So I think it's also it's easier in a way to attract people who are already here to stay here. Uh, it's good that some go out and get experience and uh, you know knowledge and support and come back. Uh, but this one, I think it should be transparent that we will see how they will do it. And especially, uh, you know, I hope uh, in order to attract talent from abroad that it will be cost effective. Uh, but to me, you know, we also have, for example, our doctors who just graduated, uh, being learned to work in neighboring countries. Uh, we should do something young talent, how to, to make them stay in Malaysia. Uh, on the EDP, I, I do agree with the move. There are good things, but I think the EDP also need to not just promote specific uh, companies and investment. What they should also do is actually to see how the entire sector is going to develop. So that other than the 131 companies that I identified now, there are other people who see how that industry is going to grow. It's not just those companies. But somebody was saying that if we get 1.4 trillion investment, we probably better than China. Thank you. I'll take the transformation question. Uh, there was, I think the question also said, what if the transformation is not successful? You know, there was a, a news article where that was, we just spoke about we are going to be bankrupt by a certain year and I do not think that is an exaggeration. So I don't think there is a option. There is no option actually uh, that we have to make that change. Uh, and so the question is not about whether we should do or not do. And it's also not a question whether we can pick and choose. I think we need to do all. So the question is how to do it. And for Mandu, has actually I hired about 50 program managers, and that's probably the largest program management house in the country. And uh, I sat in some of the program because we were facilitating one of the lab. And they were very tired. Every six weeks, Prime Minister will chair an NKRA steering committee to you know check the progress of stuff. So I, I working with them, I know they're very tired in following through. But you know what? One thing that government and politicians will always look at is if you make a change, a policy change, how would the Rakyat respond? Because like it or not, they also need to make sure that they extend their power, they extend their, their term. So therefore, they always have to balance if I do something, would the Malaysians in general benefit? And would this help me to stay in power? But you know what? If all of us Malaysians are united in our views of this is good for the country and not doing something that benefits us a small group, it will be done. So I think the process that the government has gone through through the lab approach is very tiring. I just stated that one for eight weeks is tremendously tiring. I get emails from Dr. Sui and his team between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m. They work very hard. So I'm just appealing to the nation to give benefit of doubt. If you think that they are doing the right thing, support. If you think they're not doing the right thing, give feedback. But support and not drag it back. Because like I said, my first point, there's no option, my friends. You've got no option. Can I respond a bit? Uh, yes, I think when Charles said no option, I was a bit worried. I always think that we always have option. Uh, first of all, I don't think the country is going to go bankrupt. Frankly, uh, as an economist, uh, I think some of uh, the numbers that were given, for example, subsidy on education and health, 
those are not subsidies. Those are investment for the country. Of course we have to pay for it. So I think when how you define subsidy is very important. You know, uh, the definition that use anything that is sold or provided below market price is a subsidy is wrong. You have to really look for what it is. For example, education will always have to be provided below market price because it's investment for the nation. The same thing with health. So I think we have an option. You know, there are certain subsidies that we have to remove. There are certain investments that we have to do it all the time. And the nation has been doing it all the time. And I think, uh, yes, the project is very important. But I think that the project, when it's done, must, we also need government support. Because it's not just the private sector. The government system, the policy, the delivery, and everything. And one important thing that Chang mentioned, that I think we, we must help this EPP to progress, is that the project will benefit the nation. Not just specific company or, you know, for good. It must be for the good of the country. Thank you. I'll create more questions and questions.
how many thousands of a year they can come. And they would adjust it. Second, we had to decide which sector that really needs foreign workers. Uh, so I'll give me an example of construction. So you need uh, the foreigners, so their wages are low, so therefore uh, houses in Malaysia are cheaper. I don't think so. Because this is, you remember the case of people only say that you need 10 guys to change one light bulb? You know, it doesn't mean the number, because the wages are low, the houses are cheap. You know, we probably could have a equal price, the same house at the same price if we modernize it. You know, you look at countries like Australia, they move to these industrial building standards. Everything is prepared, everything is, you know, produced by the factory, sent, and they just assemble it. So, now you have so many cracks, all the repairs that you have to do. So, what is the interest there? The interest there is we, government said we want, we want to do this, but I think that was 15 years ago. We have never moved to that building standards. Uh, and, and even palm oil, agriculture, yes, we need. But you know, Malaysia is the largest producer of palm oil in the world. You should ask yourself why Malaysia has never been able to mechanize the picking of the fruits. We have the skill. We have big companies to do this, to invest. Because we still allow the foreign workers to come in. So you never push them to upgrade. So they are certain types that, okay, I must admit my best, vested interest. Mates, I would, oh, I said we must have. Because I need mates. <laughs> so certain, certain sector we have to decide. One, so foreign labor policy. Second thing, we also must have a system how we're going to adjust wages. Now, there is no mechanism to adjust wages. You know what Singapore did? Uh, unfortunately, they always look at Singapore as an example. They are casu, but they are quite good also, you know? <laughs> okay, what is their system? Their system, every year, they have a mechanism where the government, the big employers, uh, the uh, association, the, the, the trade union, and then the private sector will sit in. And, and then they will decide and see what is the productivity growth of that year, what is the inflation, what is the economic growth, and they decide to give an indicator of wage increase. So let's say they say this year we're doing well, productivity is good, we can grow at 5%. It's not mandatory, but then the government will increase wages by 5%, all the big boys will increase wages by 5%, so the others take it as signal. So they do it every year, but it's based on productivity. Malaysia tak do. We have to wait for the government to signal, and the wage adjustment is every 10 years. <laughs> so you see, that's why it's suddenly, you know, harga naik, so the government almost lost the election. So, these are, we are flexible in other sectors, but the wages are very sticky. We are not flexible. Okay, so I think there are a few things that we have to do. For example, one of the ways to um, not cut down on, on foreign workers is that we must um, equalize the cost of hiring a foreigner and a local. For example, a foreigner will work, you know, Sunday, Saturday, uh, Saturday, Sunday, public holidays. Maybe uh, they don't have to pay the full double or triple the salary. Some of them don't pay income, uh, don't pay uh, EPF and so forth. So the cost of hiring uh, foreign workers and local workers might be different. But I must say, I cannot blame employers for hiring foreign workers because they are dedicated. Well, you know, they are there. You know, Malaysians, first, you don't know whether they come the next day or not. <laughs> so, in a way, you can't blame also, you know. And then, oh, Malaysian people are like, I'm going to sleep in the next day, I'm going to sleep So, that is our problem, okay. On the uh, Singapore productivity, if you assume, if you assume that the market is sufficient, then the wages, 
wages and the, the, the investment, the economic growth will indicate the productivity. So because based on this, definitely I think Singapore productivity is higher. But Singapore productivity is not just driven by Singaporeans, yeah? it's driven by all other people. So therefore, I, I give an, uh, an example. Singapore wages are high. But if you look at the last, I did uh, this study and the, since I think the crisis, Singapore is the, received the highest number of US FDI besides China in Asia. Why is that? That means the investor who still want to invest even though wages are high. He can only get his return because there is productivity. As simple as that. So I think you don't even have to study very deep, but if you look at some of the trends, certainly Singapore productivity is very good. But I must say I don't recommend you to go to Singapore because even though you have your wages are high, you have to work for a long time just to own a car. And to own an apartment. So you know, Malaysia in a way is better than Singapore. <laughs> okay, on the globalization, I think you're asking the impact on young professionals in particular. I think Malaysia is definitely a trading nation. Uh, so we are not new to this game of globalization. In fact, Malaysia is where it is today because of globalization, our openness, uh, the FDIs that have come in. Um, so I think globalization is a threat. I think you should look at it as more as an opportunity uh, for us, especially for the young professionals. I think most of you here also, when I spoke to some of you earlier today, are working in big multinationals, and this is a result of uh, globalization as well. But having said that, uh, I also mentioned uh, in my uh, presentation that we have to be careful about how we play this, uh, how Malaysia plays its role within the region. Uh, we've seen Malaysian corporates who have tried to grow and fail, but we've also seen a few successes. Um, but the thing is that what we know for sure is that Malaysia as a market now is already too small for even Malaysian corporates. Uh, so we need to get the support from the government especially. If you look at, you know, we'll be looking at many, uh, when we go out and advise Malaysian companies in Indonesia or even in India or China, we are competing against other Asian companies as well as European and American companies. But the Asian companies, what we notice is they have support not just from the government, but also the whole supply chain from the banks, from the regulatory authorities, from the other the suppliers and all that. And that is why they have been quite successful compared to us. So I think this is where we need to uh, basically build up our capacity. But as young professionals, again, it's an opportunity. Um, I've seen my colleague just came back from Indonesia and he said that you know, it was very hard to recruit uh, uh, Indonesians now because their salary is very high and you know, the Indonesians now are looking at Malaysians to run. Uh, if you look at Islamic banking in Indonesia, they're slowly coming up. If you look at stock working, which is what they're doing there, and investment banking. Um, the foreign houses and uh, most of the, especially on the product side, the Malaysians are coming to Indonesia as well. You see, I think, uh, like me, a lot of people in Dubai, DFIC and all that, they're all Malaysians. Uh, investment companies in Abu Dhabi by the Malaysians, and now we are seeing Malaysians also moving to Indonesia. So for young professionals, globalization actually uh, is an opportunity. Uh, that's what I think. Yeah. I agree, I do In fact, uh, Malaysian consultants are the most demanded. We've got someone in Dubai, someone in Korea, and in Vietnam, and all this. Again, like I said, the language, and the other one is quite honestly, in terms of reading lately, <laughs> so compared to, you know, for, for example, let's say Yang, say Vietnam sells a job to the central bank and they want to get a resource. If they get a resource from Singapore, it's about two and a half times the rate of Malaysia, right? And you have almost the same skill set. So the obvious choice is choosing Malaysia. So the, back to the question just now about productivity. If they, if they get paid three times, are they more three times productive than Malaysia? I do not think so. 
because there are issues of uh, comparison around exchange rate. And I also think where the economic development is in the country. Uh, but the other part about productivity, because people tend to look at if the productivity is actually revenue divided by input hours. So people look at mostly input hours. So is uh, we better train in Singapore compared to Malaysia? I don't think that is a big difference. But the big difference is the top part, the revenue. So the question is, what are customers willing to pay in Singapore or Indonesia versus in Malaysia? So that's where you took the revenue divided by number of input hours. In that sense, in terms of productivity, we are much lower. Uh, to, uh, to talk about, to talk about, to talk about the salary of Indonesian professionals, they pay in US dollars. They pay hotel rates, they pay hotel rates, if you go to uh, uh, Indonesia, is in US dollars. So, in fact, a lot of meetings for Ernst and Yang, whole of Asia Pacific is held in Indonesia because of hotel rates, is among the cheapest in the region. So, I think there is a, something that we need to do as a country, if we want to move out of this low income uh, situation to a high income, we, and that's us here as employers, are also going to be willing to pay higher and also to try and get clients and customers to pay and recognize higher. So I think that's a quiet mire that we are in a box, so we just need to break up. So back to I think the question about productivity, I do not think you can say three times because uh, there are issues around Exchange rate and coming to the state. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you very, very much to the speakers. Um, I hope this session has shed light on the problems and the measures we have taken to move forward as young Malaysians. Thank you.